Well, again, it's good to see you today. Thank you for being in your places on this Sunday morning. And uh, encourage you to turn in your Bibles now for a few minutes to the book of Romans. And when you find the book of Romans, find the fifth chapter. Romans chapter number five. And when you find your place, if you would please, let's stand as we reverence the uh, Word of God. We appreciate it immensely. Romans chapter 5. Begin reading in verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preadventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. <clears throat> Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Father, thank you today for these marvelous passages of Scripture. <clears throat> I pray that you will help me to be able to pick out of this what time would allow me to share. I realize these passages of Scripture could be exegeted for weeks and even months and possibly years. But I ask you today to give me wisdom for just a few minutes to help me to summarize some great truths to share with this waiting congregation and those beyond this auditorium. Speak to our hearts, we pray. May the Spirit of God be pleased, not grieved, but be pleased to help all of us during these few moments that remain. And we'll thank you because we ask this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you. In a series of messages that I started last week on the coming of the Lord, I endeavored to go into one of the big events that will take place at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But as I begin to prepare for that this week, the Lord led me to go the direction that I'm going. Because there's so much here that <clears throat> needs to be stated. I attempted this week to talk to us today about what is called the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. I will get to that. But before I get to it, I want to talk to you about two other judgments in the Bible. Now, there are many judgments set forth in the Scriptures. But today, I want to begin to talk to you about three judgments. The first judgment that I want to talk to you about is our judgment as sinners. The second judgment that I want to talk to us about 
is our judgment as sons. And the third judgment, I want to talk to us about is our judgment as servants. Now, I hope you'll remember those three words beginning with the letter S. Sinners, sons, servants. Three judgments. If you get saved, then the two latter judgments apply to your life. But let's begin first of all today with the first judgment. Our judgment as sinners. It's important that we never get tired of this message. And the message is Calvary covers it all. The message is that the Lord Jesus Christ took our place at Calvary. Over and over in these passages of Scripture, I've read in our hearing today, we have been taught that. But the scope of this judgment that took place at Calvary covers all of our sins. Now, I've had people to say this to me down through the years. I know when I get saved that it takes care of my past sins. But what about my present sin? What about my future sins? And my response is always this. What is now to us our past sin and our present sin and our future sin was all future sin when he died on the cross of Calvary. He did not die just to take care of a sin. He died completely to take care of all of our sin. God looked down through the telescope of time and he saw every sin that we would ever commit. Now, I'm not going to ask you today if you've ever sinned. I don't think anybody would be here that would be so sanctimonious that you'd say you're looking at somebody that has never sinned. Because if you're living and breathing and you have enough mentality to know that one and one is two and two is two and two and two is four, you know that you've sinned. I know I've sinned. And I know we've all sinned. But God looked down through the telescopic time and knew every sin we would ever commit. Every single one of them. You say, you mean he knew the sins I would commit before I ever committed? Yeah, yeah. Because he's God. He knows everything. There's nothing that he does not understand. There's nothing that he does not know. He knew every sin that you would ever commit in your life. And the scope of Calvary was offered to take care of every sin you would ever commit. God put all of our sins in one big package and laid them on Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's the reason Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let me stop and say this. Quit trying to work and take away your sins when Jesus Christ has already finished that work of salvation for you, your work is futile. His is wonderful. Our work is not sufficient. The Bible says that our works are the same as filthy rags in the sight of God. But the scope of his work takes care of the sins of the whole world. You say, how can we know that God is satisfied with our sins when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. I can give you three words that tells you today that God is satisfied with the work of Calvary, an empty tomb. God raised his son 
because he was satisfied with the blood sacrifice of Calvary. In certain parts of the world, I don't know if they still do this or not, but in bygone days, a merchant selling his goods would place his goods out on a counter, but he wouldn't put a price tag on it. Now he's displaying all that he has to offer to sell, but there's no price tag there. If someone's interested in his goods, they lay on the counter some money. If the merchant is not satisfied with the money that's been laid on the counter, he just lets it lay there. The individual trying to purchase his merchandise, realizing that he's not satisfied with the price, if he wants the merchandise, he will lay some more money there. If the merchant still refuses to pick up the money, then the individual will have to lay some more money there. Eventually, the merchant reaches out when he's satisfied with the amount of money and he picks up the money and puts it in his pocket. Now, when he picks up the money and puts it in his pocket, here's what he's saying. I'm satisfied with the payment. When the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and God seated him at the right hand there in heaven, the Father was saying, I'm satisfied with the payment. He raised him and he set him. Now that brings us to the finality of the judgment. Jesus on the cross said three words. It is finished. When Jesus said it's finished, that simply means, let me tell you what it means in the Greek, it is finished. And let me tell you what it means in the Hebrew, it is finished. Let me tell you what it means in Aramaic, it is finished. Let me tell you what it means in the Beta dialect, it is finished. And let me tell you what it means in your dialect, it is finished. That means nothing else needs to be added to it. That means that God has provided a salvation for every individual, every member of Adam's race sufficient to blot out, to justify, and to cover once and for all the scope of this salvation. The finality of our salvation is a once and for all finished transaction. Have you ever bought something sometime and maybe it's used and they get you a used car and they get you to sign on the bottom line and they'll say something like this. Now they don't say it in these words, but this is what they mean. When you drive it off of the lot, it's yours. And you may get down the street two blocks and the thing breaks down. It's yours. Well, I want to tell you something. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're getting a salvation that doesn't break down. You're getting something that's so complete in the mind of God. Uh, he says in the book of Romans chapter 8, he already sees you glorified. He already sees you in his presence whenever death comes or the rapture takes place. This salvation is so final that those he justified, he glorifies. Yeah. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's just suppose, and we have some law enforcement officers in here today, but let's just suppose that a law enforcement officer catches a guy going 100 miles an hour in a 35 mile per hour zone. And he brings him in, and let's just say as quick as the officer catches the guy, at that moment he can bring him right on in front of the judge. And he comes before the judge, and the judge happens to be the boy's father. And so the law enforcement officer brings him before the boy's father. And the law enforcement officer says, Your Honor, we clocked your son doing 100 miles per hour in a 35 mile per hour zone. Now, what's the father going to do? It is his son. 
Is he going to give him leniency? Is he going to treat him like he would treat everybody else, every other lawbreaker that stands in his presence? The whole courtroom is watching. The judge's son is standing in front of him. He has broken the law. And so, and I'm just making this up, but I'm giving you a spiritual application. Let's just say that the judge looks at his son and he says to his son, guilty. And then he passes sentence on his son. And uh, he says, son, you got a choice. $500 or 30 days in jail. And the boy stands there and he realizes he don't have any money. So he says, I, I don't have any money, Dad. And so the law enforcement officer gets him and starts to take him out to put him in jail for 30 days. And the judge says, wait just a minute. The judge says, bring him back. And his boy comes back in front of the judicial bench. The judge stands up. He takes his long judicial robe off. He walks down where his son is standing. And he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out a checkbook. And he writes a check for $500. And he hands that check to his son. And the son takes that check and gives it to the clerk or whomever. Now, what has that father done? The father's done two things. Number one, he has shown that in spite of what his son did, he still loves him. He was willing to get up. He was willing to walk down the steps, come around where his son who had broken the law, he was willing to get up, show his love. I know you've done wrong, but I still love you. And he was willing to get up and come down where he was. I'm about to have a fit. Are you with me? And when he came down where he was, then he satisfied the law. He wrote a check. The law says $500. So he not only got up and came down and showed his love where he was, but he wrote a check to take care of the penalty. So his love and justice was both satisfied. Everybody listening to me today, if you're saved, God's love and God's justice is satisfied. Amen. There's no recalls. Uh, he, he proved his love in that he got up in eternity and he came down where we are. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ever convince yourself that you're not loved. If you want to know what real love is, he that was rich in eternity became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. If you want to know as to whether or not God loves you, look at his condescension. He had the worship of his created beings, angels. He had eternality with his father, a fellowship that had never been broken. All that eternity had to offer. He laid it aside because he said, the object of my love is that lost group of people down there on earth. And he proved his love. He didn't just say, I love you. He proved his love. He got up out of eternity. He came down here 2,000 years ago. But we had violated the holiness of God. We had violated uh, the sacredness of God. We had violated the heart of God because God is holy. And no one can enter into his presence unless they have that holiness. We deserve to go to hell. The wages of sin is death. We ought to go to hell. We should have gone to hell. Yep. But he said, I love you. And he got up. And he came down here. And eventually, in so many words, he said, you owe debt. You cannot pay. 
but I'll pay a debt and set you free. Now, when that judge got up off of that bench and came down there and wrote that check and handed it to his son, his son had a decision to make. He could accept, he could reach out and accept the check or he could be taken and incarcerated for an amount, a period of time. It was the son's choice. The father got up to prove his love. He offered him what was necessary to be set free, but ultimately it was the choice of that boy as to whether or not he was set free or he'd go to jail. Hear me today. God's love has been exhibited towards everybody listening to my voice. That's indisputable. In this was love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son into this world to be the propitiation for our sins. Greater love had no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends and you're my friends he said if you do whatsoever I command you there's nothing today I could use uh, to illustrate the greatness of God's love more than just saying from eternity he came into time and he went to Calvary to satisfy the justice of God by shedding his blood his perfect blood and giving up his life for you and for me Amen. but hear me well it's an invitation you have to accept. Amen. When that son reached out for that check, he had a choice. I'll take the check, I'll go to jail. Mercy is extended. Grace is available. Forgiveness is available. But it's up to you. If you want to be saved and you're not saved, salvation is within the reach of these words. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And you can be saved. I want you to notice why we need to be saved in Romans chapter 5. I want you to notice the sad plight of the human race. I want you to notice in chapter 5 verse number 6. For when we were without strength. I want you to look at that real hard. I want you to think about that in depth. When we were without strength. Two things established there. Number one, we did not have the strength to live a life pleasing to God. Because the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it must surely die. We did not, listen closely, we did not have the strength to live a perfect life. Only people whose sins are gone, who've been cleansed, uh, can get into the presence of a holy God. We don't have any holiness of our own to commend us to God. We don't have the strength to live a life over and above sin. None of us do. When we were without strength. Secondly, doesn't it, it not only means that we didn't have the strength to live the life. But secondly, it means, and hear me well. We did not have the strength through whatever reason to save ourselves. There's nothing we can do. You're talking about hopeless. Man, this crowd today that says, well, I'm doing the best I can. You're hopeless. Your best is not good enough. You say, well, I'm trying. It's not good enough. You say, I've been a good parent. You're not good enough. You say, I've been a good mother. You're not good enough. You say, I've been a good young person. You're not good enough. You say, I contribute in the community. I go to church now and then. I pray now and then. Hey, you're not good enough. When we was without strength, without strength to live a holy life, without strength to lift ourselves up by our bootstraps to be acceptable into the presence of God. We are without strength to do so. There's nothing more pitiful than going around the hospital and seeing these folks, many of whom just a week or two previous to that occasion, something tragic has happened and they don't even have enough strength to get out of the bed and walk. How tragic. Oh, I've spent so many years of my life in the hospital and visiting and intensive care. And uh, within the last year, so many weeks with my dear wife. And you see all of these people who just a few years ago were healthy and robust, 
they, they could come and go and do as they pleased. But a dreadful disease has now crippled them and impaired them. And they're in critical condition, many of them. And they're unable to function. It's, it's pitiful. It's terrible. But let me tell you what's worse than that. Hear me well. What is worse than that is a, 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 body, a body who's able to come and go, who thinks they have relatively good health and they got food on the table and they've got a car to drive and clothes on their back and they're able to get along in this life and enjoy this life, but yet they've never been saved. There's nothing in this world, nothing in this world, nothing in this world that is as bad, that is as critical as a well person or a sick person who is without Jesus Christ and they don't have the strength to do anything to help their cause unless they they come to Jesus Christ. We're without strength. Notice he continues in verse number six to say something else. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for it. I want you to notice the word. Who did he die for? He died for people who were without strength, but notice the next word. He died for the ungodly. Oh, you say, preacher, I've seen some of them on television. Well, let me tell you where you can go today to see some. Look in the mirror. The word ungodly simply means to be without God. And it can be a fine specimen of the human race. I never will forget, I heard Dr. B.R. Lakin say years ago, he preached a message, I guess similar to what I'm preaching this morning. And he said after the service, he said this fine, cultured, older woman came up. And he said it was very obvious that she had a lot of money. Said she had on silk and satin. That was the phrase he used. And said she had an expensive necklace around her neck and had, all, had rings on about all of her fingers. And he'd been preaching about there's none good, no, not one. And she came up to him with all of her silk and satin and all of her finery after the service and kind of pressed up to him. And said, preacher, I reject that sermon. She said, look at me. I'm going to get along good. I've got plenty of money. I've got plenty of clothes. I've got plenty of jewelry. I resent you calling me ungodly and comparing me to the person fallen out on the street. He said, she said, I resent that. And he had to go back and try to get her to understand in the sight of God, there is none righteous. No, not one. God does not look on what we're wearing outwardly when it comes to salvation. God doesn't check the bank account. God doesn't check how many acres we own. God looks at the heart. And if he sees the heart depraved and having not been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, ungodly. Listen to me well. Some of the finest people I've ever, called, I've ever met in my life have been lost people. I can go down the list. And time will not allow me to do so. I could go down the list. I could tell you person after person that I've known through the years not necessarily here. But going back to other churches, my home church, and other places, people who never had any movement toward God, but they carry their Bible faithfully to the church. You'd look at them and you'd say, if there's ever been a specimen of Christianity, that person right there is the specimen of Christianity. And yet in one instance, and there's many instances, I remember one instance, my pastor went to see a guy, he was on up in years, never missed a service at church unless he was sick, providentially hindered. He went in and sat down and called him by his name. And he said, I've been concerned about you. The Lord's laid you on my heart. He called him by his name and he said, if you died right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? 
And that man who'd been going faithfully to church for 60 some years said, no preacher, I don't know that. He said, all of these years I've known something's wrong and something's missing, but he said, I just haven't been able to figure out what it was. And there in that man's living room, my pastor took the Bible and showed that man who was one of the finest men in the community, a man who was always in church. He showed that man that all of our goodnesses are as filthy rags, that we are without strength, and that outside of Jesus Christ we are ungodly, and we need to be saved. And that man that day bowed his head in his living room, and he trusted Christ as his Savior. Hear me. Hear me well today. One of the tragedies of this hour is the goodness of people, the goodness they think they've got uh, to, uh, to, to get into the presence of the Lord. We don't go to heaven because we're good. We go to heaven because he was good and we accepted his goodness toward us. Notice what he said, powerless, ungodly. Look at verse 8. Romans 5, 8, here's another word he calls us, but God commendeth his low, low, word toward you, saying that while we were yet, look at this, sinners, we're without strength, we're ungodly, and he says we're sinners. Now, we don't like to be called sinners. We think we're better than that, don't we? You go up to somebody and you say, how are you doing today, sinner? They're going to give you the second look, and they're going to say, what would you call me? <laughs> sinner. How, how are you getting along today, sinner? Why are you calling me a sinner? You know, they'll get defensive. Why get defensive? We're all sinners. Amen. We've all missed the mark. We're imperfect. Our creator is perfect. We're unholy. Our creator is holy. Amen. We missed the mark. We're sinners. Hear me. We've not all sinned to the same degree. But we're all sinners. And here's where this goodness stuff comes in. You tell somebody after you talk to them, well, you know, I don't want you to get mad at me, but you know you're a sinner. And here's the way they, they come back at it. I'm not as bad as that person. You call me a sinner. What do you call that guy? What do you call that lady? Well, I'm as good as everybody over there at that church. I know some of those people over there at that church. And I'm going to tell you, I'm as good as they are. I've heard that more times than I can count on my hands and toes. I'm as good as they are. Nobody in the world is contesting the fact as to whether or not we're as good as somebody else. But let me tell you, and hear me well. If you want to know how much holiness and godliness you have and righteousness you have, don't compare yourself to somebody else. Compare yourself to Jesus Christ. That's the standard. And when you lay your life down beside of Jesus Christ, you come up short. I come up short. Jesus is the standard. You want to know what the gold bullion is? It's Jesus Christ. We've got, to be, we've got to have holiness that we don't possess if we get to heaven. We've got to have righteousness we don't possess if we get to heaven. And Jesus, when we get saved, becomes our holiness. And Jesus becomes our righteousness. And then we're accepted, acceptable in the beloved. Look at this. I must hurry. Time's about out. But look at verse 10 of Romans chapter 5. Here's something else we are. For if when we were enemies, we're enemies. Look at that. The Bible said we're enemies. Why are we enemies? Because we're rebels. We have rebelled against the throne of God. We've, re we've rebelled against His holiness. We've rebelled against perfection. There is, there is enmity between us and God. The Bible uses that word enmity, that we are at enmity with God. But what's the solution? Thank you for asking. Look in your Bibles, please, in the book of Romans, our text. Look at verse number six again. 
For when we were yet without strength, in due time, oh, blessed be God, in due time, in due time. What does that mean? It means in the timing of God before eternity passed, down to the zero hour in due time, he sent his son in due time to come into this world. He got here in time to save us. He got here in time to save everybody that's been saved in due time. But watch the rest of this. Christ died for the ungodly. Now I want you to look at that phrase. Christ died for. Here's what it means. Christ died instead of us. Amen. Did you get it? He died instead of us. You say, preacher, but I've got to die if the rapture takes place. That's true. But when he died for us, he died in such a way that he has provided for us the forgiveness of sins, the righteousness we need, the holiness we need, and the moment that we accept him, he has already paid our penalty. He has already paid our indebtedness. Uh, he has already paid for our lost eternity. He has already paid for the flames of hell forever. In due time, he paid the price completely. It is finished on the cross. It's paid. It's complete. In due time, he died for instead of the ungodly. I don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. The world don't have to go to hell. The world can go to heaven because he took our place and it's called divine love. He died instead of us. Well, it gets better. Verse number seven. For scarcely for a righteous man who one die, yet branch here for a good man, some would even dare to die. Can you think of anybody right now you'd die for? You say, well, I'd be willing to die for my wife. Wonderful. You say, well, I'd be willing to die for my husband. Okay. What about the neighbor across the street that won't speak to you? Would you be willing to die for him? What about that person that you work for down on the job? over there in the factory that's always giving you a hard time. Would you die for that person? What about the person, if you're walking down the street, decides to spit on you? Would you be willing to die for that person? He said there might be somebody at the human race, notice what he said, would be willing to die for. Scarcely for a righteous man would want to die. Pretty venture, maybe a good man. Some would even dare to die. But what did God do? In verse number 8, he commended. That means he proved his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died in our place. He died for us. Yes, we, 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 we happen to be represented at the cross, the crowd that spit on him. We happen to be represented at the cross, the crowd that cursed him. The crowd that drove the nails in his precious hands and feet. We happen to be represented there when they say, Thou be the Christ, come down off of the cross. All the people that persecuted him, all of his enemies, they were not his friends, they were his enemies. And so were we. All of us who are responsible for his death on the cross, all of us, not friends, but enemies, he died for. He took our place. Yes, he, he died instead of us. Oh, it makes me want to stand right now and just sing that song. Oh, what a Savior. Amen. Oh, what a <laughs> Oh, what a Savior. You say, preacher, what's the benefit? You don't have enough time. You'd starve to death if you let me have enough time to tell you. But let me just give you one great one right here. Look with me, please, in verse number 10 of Romans chapter 5. For if when we, when we were yet sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled. I want you to watch this phrase. We shall be saved. 
by his life. We shall be saved. What does that mean? We're saved by the life he is now living. He's alive at the right hand of the Father. He's watching over us. We're saved. When we commit our soul to him, he's alive to make sure that it stays committed, that there's nothing in this world, there's nothing under this world, there's nothing in the universe that has the ability to unsecure the secured. And he has saved us. In verse number nine, much more being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved. Watch this. From wrath. What is that? If you're saved today, you're saved, first of all, from hell. That's the wrath of God poured out on the lost people. Aren't you glad you're not going to have to go to hell? Man, that ought, to be, that ought to be enough to get you to stand to your feet and say hallelujah 10,000 times over. I don't have to go to hell. I've been saved from the wrath to come. The only thing I'll ever know about is what I read about it in the Bible. I don't have to go there. And neither do you. The first judgment in the Bible is the judgment of sinners where he took our place and died in our stead and suffered the penalty of all of our sins. We're going to stand in just a moment. I want you to hear my statement before we stand. We're fortunate to live in the Bible Belt of America. We're fortunate that there's still a lot of fundamental churches preaching what I've been preaching today. But one of the tragedies of being in fundamental churches and hearing the message that I preach today is I'm afraid it gets to be old hat. I'm afraid we kind of get used to the message and it don't mean to us what it ought to mean to us the way it should. Let me tell you something. Nobody's ever loved you like Jesus. But listen, nobody's ever suffered for you like Jesus. And not only lost person do you owe him your soul, but saved person, you owe him your best. Because he, he gave his life to keep you out of hell. You owe him your best. If you're kind of cold and indifferent today and it don't mean what it ought to you, ought, when we stand in just a moment, you ought to just stand and keep coming, get around this altar and say, Lord, you've done so much for me. I haven't expressed gratitude like I should. I want you to forgive me. We need to do that. We need to get back and fall in love with our Savior all over again because of what he has done for us. And if you've never been saved, the songwriter said, there's room at the cross for you. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. If you're kindly away from the Lord, you ought to get out right now and just come on down here to this altar. Don't wait. While these are coming, I think if we'd be honest, there'd be many Christians today who would find their way down here. I think we'd have to say today, Lord, I haven't loved you like I should after you've done so much for me. I think we'd have to just be honest today and say, oh God, draw me a little closer to you today. Lord, help me to enjoy being saved to a greater degree today than I, than I have enjoyed it because I've kind of gotten cold and I've drifted away and I'm not as close to you as I ought to be. Oh, God, help me. And then if you're here today and you've never been saved, there's room at the cross for you. You can come be saved today. You don't have to leave out of here lost. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Who'd raise your hand and say, preacher, pray for me. I've never been saved. I know I need to be saved. I ought to be saved. I sure don't want to die and go to hell. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up high so I can see it? Yes, yes, I see your hands. Someone else? Heavenly Father, I pray for these. Oh, God, help us today. Lord, we've come face to face today with our soul salvation. And we've come face to face today with the reality of a Savior that would not let us go. And I pray you'll help us to love you more. 
and hands that might have gone up today signifying they've never been saved. Help them to turn loose and come and get saved today. In Jesus' name, the quartet singing. These guys are singing. If you need to come, come on out right now. Others.